Hi, everybody. Welcome to our Ask an Accountant webinar focusing on the importance of building a budget. Before we get started, I just wanted to share a few notes about this webinar. You will be receiving the recording and the slides from today's webinar and the follow-up email going out tomorrow morning. Also, if you're having any technical difficulties throughout our webinar, we suggest you refresh your GoToWebinar page and re-enter the webinar. Just want to quickly say thank you and welcome back to Edie. Uh, Edie, if you want to take the webinar from here, thank you. That's great. Thanks, Nick. So welcome everybody. I am really excited to be presenting uh, today. This is going to be a little bit different than um, some of my other webinars that you may have seen me talk about. Um, so I'm titling this Don't Say the B Word because that is exactly what a friend of mine said to me at a party uh, a, a while ago. Um, we were at this party. She hadn't seen me in a while and she asked me what I was doing. And at the time, I was helping people to organize their personal finances. So I told them a little bit about the program that I had started. And she said to me, oh, wow, I really think that I could um, benefit from that program. But if we work together, you can't say the B word to me. And I'm like, why in the world would I call you the B word? And um, she's like, no, not that B word. Um, just don't say to me budgeting. And um, I thought, wow, I, I really don't know how I would talk about personal finances without using the word budgeting, but I really get it. And she explained then why. Um, but I do get that sentiment. I really do understand how budgeting feels so restrictive. It's like another swear word that is a four letter word, which is diet. So I do understand that we think of diets and budgeting in the same realm because we think of it as very, very restrictive. But if I've done my job right today, I hope that you will see that budgeting is incredibly empowering. It is actually matching um, how you spend your money and a real respect for money and earning it um, with your values. So we're gonna talk a lot about values today. And hopefully you will break some of those connotations that, that being, um, invested in, in the budgeting process is restrictive, like a diet. We're gonna break that um, theory up. All right, so just because I told you that we're gonna talk about values, that's how we're gonna start. So in ACT, acceptance and commitment therapy, I hardly need to tell you therapists this, but in ACT moves towards our values are what bring us joy, right? For the most part. And moves away from our values are what cause us discomfort or stress. OK, it's going to be really, really tough for me to talk to you about your private practice and budgeting without also talking about budgeting in your personal lives. OK, so the good news is that doing some things um, budgeting wise for your personal uh, budget is going to really help your business budget. But the bad news is it goes in the reverse as well. So some, some bad habits that you might have with money and budgeting and sticking to uh, a plan uh, in your personal life are also probably going to be reflected in your business life. So let's talk about personal, personal um, budgeting a little bit. So what do you value? Um, we really want to match so those towards moves what we value with how we spend our money. Um, but um, and so we want to evaluate, you know, our, how much are we spending that is towards those values. But debt really prevents us being, from being able to spend our money um, according to our values because we're so tied down to paying off our debt. So debt prevents us from connecting our money to our values. But intentional saving is valuing your peace of mind. So that is um, where if you value your peace of mind, you're going to probably do some behaviors that are more forward thinking towards your values. Um, where do we tend to self-sabotage and punish ourselves by overspending? I can't talk about this enough, um, but I really want you to be able to see that earning money in your business, in your private practice, some of the pitfalls with that probably have to do with um, some self-worth, some issues of self-sabotage, and um, really understanding our own value. Okay, let's talk about the business side with values. So I, so I like to tell people that I suffer from um, certification-itis. Like I just keep trying to get more and more certifications. And it used to be that I kept thinking I need to invest in certifications in order to prove my worth as a therapist. But 
slowly I let go of that more and more so that now when I invest in in more education it's just to sharpen and hone my skills sharpen my saw if you will so is continuing education and investment to honing your skills or are you still feeling not yet qualified until you invest more in education so how much do you suffer from imposter syndrome um, <clears throat> and if you aren't sure of your worth in your private practice looking to clients to pay your full fee is going to keep you feeling guilty. So we can't ask others to value us if we don't value ourselves first. So if you have defined your value to clients as fixing their problems, could you see how helping them might constantly seem insufficient? So what do we do as therapists? We help clients by giving them space by truly listening to their stories, to being a passenger, this is what I call it, being a passenger um, on their journey for a short period of time. But our value is not in becoming responsible for their problems. So I'm just gonna start uh, this webinar by giving you a couple of tips and tricks. Now this is both personal and professionally, um, but these are just some of the things that I picked up all along the way from listening to different experts and trying them out myself. So you're gonna, this, these are all kind of random, but uh, I just wanna kind of throw these things out there for some for helpful tips to begin with. So Susie Orman said something years ago, I listened to one of her um, talks and um, this really stuck with me. This, this happened so many years ago, but it's, it still stays with me. Um, Susie Orman says to show your money respect. So in the day and age when we used to use more cash than we do now, now we use more debit and credit cards, but um, um, she taught me that um, to organize my wallet. So to have my ones, fives, tens, twenties, all organized so that when you go to pay for something, you're showing that respect to your money. I know it sounds kind of silly, but it really does work. Um, so make a game out of lowering your spending. I love playing games. Um, I'm just gonna give you a, a quick example. So um, my husband had at his work, he has um, the option of, of investing in a, a flex spend program. So if you spend this, you can put a certain amount of money into a flex spend account where you can spend that on medical expenses. For our plan, we can spend it on uh, dental and, um, and eye um, expenses. So um, I didn't anticipate that my son's wisdom teeth was gonna cost as much as it did. So I maxed out on my flex spend. Um, and um, I need to see an, an eye doctor. So this is October, and um, so a couple more months um, left where I don't have um, the flex spend money to be able to spend for the eye doctor appointment. Now I can easily pay out of pocket for an eye doctor appointment. So I wear contact lenses, um, an eye doctor appointment when you go for a prescription for eyeglasses is every two years. But for contact lenses, it's every year. But it really, really bugs me that all they do for that contact lens appointment is put the same contact in my eye that I've been using for years, look at me, see if, if it's all working correctly, and then they charge me a, an arm and a leg in order to get that um, prescription for my contacts so I can get more contacts. Now, I'm running very low on my contacts, and uh, so I really should go to the doctor and pay, but I'm making this a game. I'm, I'm trying to see how many days I can go um, and trying to wait till my flex spend um, re-ups in January. So I am making a game out of this and it's really empowering. It's really fun to know that, yeah, I, I could um, go to the eye doctor and have an ample supply of my contact lenses, but I really spent a lot of money last year on new glasses. So I, I don't use them because I use my contacts. So I'm having fun using my glasses too. So that's just one example. It's a silly example, but one example where you can make a game out of investing in yourself. So make small adjustments to physical clutter. You might not see the connection, but look at your surroundings to see any areas where you might be punishing yourself. Cleaning and organizing areas actually shake up how you feel about yourself. It, reducing physical clutter helps to reduce mind clutter. 
So get creative with low cost, lower cost uh, entertainment. So invest in fun classes. I um, I love to take different classes. And for the most part, adult education classes are pretty low cost. They're at, usually at your community college. Um, but how much of your entertainment on the weekends is really spent in going out and eating? Because that's one big budget area. We're going to talk about food in, in a little bit. Um, that's one area where you can really start um, to have it go out of control. So invest in, in hobbies that are relatively low cost and, and see how much fun you have with that. All right, so um, if you do have debt, either personal or professional debt, um, you wanna list your debt from lowest to highest, okay? Now this is not what some um, finance experts will tell you, but it is a it's part of the Dave Ramsey system, and um, I really do believe this. This is very much in line with, um, now talk about uh, weight loss and dieting. This is uh, very much along the same lines. So list your debt from lowest to highest. Still pay the minimums on all of your debt. So we don't want to not pay on certain debt. You still want to pay the minimum amount that you have to pay on all of your debt every month but get crazy at attacking the lowest debt first. So that first one on your list. So let's just say you owe $500 on a credit card. You wanna, but you owe 20,000 on something else. And that's at the lower end of the spectrum. You wanna just attack that $500 to get it off of the list. So it really does create this very positive snowball effect when you can see some gains right at the beginning by reducing and take completely taking off your lowest debt. Um, it's just like if you need to lose a lot of weight, let's say you need to lose 50 pounds. Having the goal of losing 50 pounds right now um, is not going to work unless you break it down into steps. So you might want to say, okay, I'm just going to start to eat healthy this week and see what kind of difference that makes. Maybe I'm just going to try to lose one pound this week, something like that, where you're you're seeing some gains because we got to keep some, the positivity going. Okay. Now the reason that sometimes this defies logic for some fi financial experts is because you probably they would tell you go for the ones that are charging you the highest interest rate pay those down first but i'm telling you if you look if you actually put it down in the list first of all that in and of itself is rewarding because my guess is you just think of your debt as your debt is this big huge snowball but if you break it down into steps on what actually you do oh by putting it down on paper you will start to become to forming a plan all right, consider the price of QuickBooks Online. So I have a lot of people who ask me um, about different accounting software packages and they will ask me, what do you think of this one? Because it's free. And um, so I really want you to start thinking about um, if it's free, um, that's how much that that company is is getting benefit from it somehow because they're going to try and get you to invest in their premium. But um, what we pay for, and this is where I'm going to try and um, change your thinking about that, what we pay for shows what we value. So if you are only going for the free programs for accounting software packages, that tells me that you might not see the value of why you need a sophisticated accounting software program, okay? So consider the price of QuickBooks Online. Without discounts right now, um, the QuickBooks Simple Start, which is usually the program that I recommend for most private practitioners. Um, right now it's $30 a month. I also can get you a discount for the first year, but without discounts right now, it's only $30 a month. So isn't being organized with a sophisticated, really good program um, worth more than that? I mean, $30 a month. I know, I know that might sound very expensive to some, but consider the value that you are getting. And it does show you that you have respect for the accounting system and why that might be important for um, success in your business. Okay, so I'm gonna go on a little rant here. Um, so I just was watching a free webinar. Now, again, I, I get inundated with all kinds of offerings all the time. Um, but this one was really something, it was a side hobby, and it was really something I was interested in. And um, they, 
I'm, I'm, I've changed the numbers, but basically she lost me at the end because she was trying to have me um, buy this program that was not um, was not free. So that was the whole reason for behind the webinar was to give you something enticing to then sell me on this uh, uh, program that she was selling. And she said, this, these are not the numbers because I um, I just wanted to change a little bit, but I see this all the time. So she said the price is $197. Just by seeing that, that alone, if even if she did a lot of other stuff that I, I will talk about. And then the reason I'm bringing the, up this example is because I see this all the time in the exact same way. So, and I'm sure you have to. So the price is $197. Now automatic, right? just that sentence alone has told me okay they're trying to manipulate me because they have heard that the psychology behind your pricing is is that you should end your pricing in 97 or 99 for some odd reason they think 97 is even even better than 99 it used to be everybody only took a dollar off right so our relationship from the very beginning is you trying to make me feel like i'm paying less so you're manipulating our relationship from the beginning. So if, if you had to talk about one of the things that I value the most, it's honesty and authenticity. That's probably one of my absolute top values. If it's not number one, it's it's in the top three. So, um, so I really, really value truth and authenticity. So by just telling me that your price is 197, you've lost me already. Okay, now she went on to say this, when you pay 197, I'm going to give you all of these bonuses and she listed it all out with a price with each one where the value is 1999, $1,997. So she's, I'm gonna be paying $200 and I'm gonna be getting a value of $2,000. So if, that person really, really felt that the value was $2,000 on what she was providing me, why would they charge $197? So why do you want others to think that they are getting a deal by you lowering your value? Okay, I just want you to kind of think about what are the subtle messages that we're giving off on that? So I have kind of a silly, another silly example. I'm full of silly examples today. Um, so I was pregnant with my first child, a friend of mine, even before I was pregnant, she just kept talking about her OBGYN, that he was just so fabulous. And so when I got pregnant, she was one of my first calls. I'm like, I've got to have your OBGYN. And she's like, okay, great. So she gave me the number and I know she probably called him to say, could you fit me in? Because he is that good he's got a wait list and um and so i know she probably pulled some strings to be able to have me make an appointment because i was able to make an appointment um i went into this appointment i'm so excited um and of course nervous too because this is my first first uh, baby and um and i was i presented them with my um medical card and they took my insurance and they said uh-oh your doctor, your regular internist is not in our practice. They're in a different county, or not county, but different different medical provider series. So you can't see this doctor because your internist, your regular medical doctor is in a different practice. I'm like, oh no, I, I, I can't, I gotta see this doctor. This is all that I really wanted to do. And even though I had been with my internist um, for quite some time and really liked them, um, uh, I said, well, what do I do? And, and they said, well, you could get a different doctor right now. And um, maybe we could still do all this. I got there early. Maybe we could still do all this and get your appointment. Still have you be seen. I'm like, well, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what kind of internist I would get. And some a nurse <laughs> overheard us and she's like, well, I go to this doctor. Do you want to go to that doctor? And so I'm like, okay, sure. Sign me up for that doctor. So I was sitting down. It all worked out. And I was filling out the paperwork and I started shaking because I just was like, oh my gosh, how good can this OBGYN be? Because I've just now changed all of my, of my 
thinking. All, I, all of my doctors, everything, I've changed everything about it. This doctor I had to travel quite a distance to see too. Um, but five minutes with that doctor and I realized, oh yeah, he's that good. He is that good. I, I don't know what it was, but he listened to me. He tried to figure out how I might be feeling. Um, he, he just created space for me. It, it is exactly what I think we do as therapists when we're that good. So he didn't need to undervalue himself at all. I, I was, I was thinking there's no way he could be that good that I've changed my entire life, but he, he really, really was. It's kind of an example where if we really know our value, we don't undermine our value. All right, you might be thinking, what does all this have to do with, um, with budgeting? So if you have earned good money in a helping profession, you are doing these things that you might not even realize, okay? So you're role modeling to others that it is best to invest in mental health tools. If you're trying to convince somebody that therapy is a good idea and they actually invest in you, especially if they you don't take insurance and they are paying private pay you are telling them yes you are worth it to invest in your mental health um you are uh, not suffering from imposter syndrome because you're charging a good rate for your value you know your value and you're telling others you're valuable you are breaking the cycle of abuse and trauma that has held you back you're letting go of some of those um um, negative self-talk thoughts and emotions. You are listening to clients' needs and how to help them best. You are knowing that you, your value is in listening and creating space for them and really helping them. You are a faithful steward of your money. You are more respectful of your personal spending. So there's less passive aggressive behaviors because you've got skin in the game. You're more aware of what things cost. You're more aware of how difficult it is to earn a good wage. So many people who aren't working at the, at the moment don't have a real appreciate, or maybe who have never worked, don't have a real appreciation for how difficult it really is to earn money. And so, they might not be as respectful of money and what things cost and what you really do need versus um, is, is more frivolous. Um, you, you have more skin in the game. So um, watch what happens when you start paying attention to budgeting, planning for your money. Watch how successful you start becoming in other areas of your life. It's a crazy, crazy thing, but I have seen it time and time again. When you start being um, more mindful of how you're spending money. If you wanted to lose weight, you start losing weight. If you wanted to kick an addiction habit, you start to kick the addiction habit. You start proving to yourself that you are worth it. You have made honest money. All right. So how much space and time and energy do you invest in your business? So I want to give you an example of, um, a, a, of an accounting client that I had a long time ago. They were a restaurant. And when I first started doing their accounting, I would go in like maybe once or twice a month. And um, they had this space in their restaurant, which was really unusual. Huge, huge um, table. They used it for, um, they, they made candies and such, and they would use it for um, sometimes big orders. But whenever I was there, I got free reign of all of this space. And um, slowly, over time, they need more and more of that space. So they ended up putting in a um, walk-in refrigerator or freezer um, for that space. So I lost that space. Then I started going into, a, into their office and there were like three or four people and we were all using the same desk. It was crazy. We would put stuff on the printer. Then when we wanted to print stuff, we would take stuff off. It got so bad that at the end of working with this client, I had to get on my hands and knees to open their safe to be able to put the receipts into the safe and the money into the safe. Um, and I just saw more, less and less space for being able to do some of the administrative tasks, okay? Um, so how much space we give to the different areas of our life, and that, in, that space includes how much time and energy we devote to it, shows how much we value it. And they were valuing the accounting less and less in the restaurant to the point where I could no longer um, be their accountant because they weren't, they didn't, weren't respecting how much, how important that, that was to their business. 
Um, I just mentioned what um, what we get with um, free accounting software. Um, you know, there's there's not a whole lot that is truly truly free. But when we don't, when we only feel like we should be investing in free software because people or companies are offering free software, that tells us that we might not see the value in um, in creating that time and space for accounting. So as a business owner, you have to protect yourself from those who seek to benefit from your license. Like I just mentioned, I'm inundated with people asking me, um, you know, to buy their program or I'm constantly having to say no, 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 because when they know you have a license, they want to rob you. I mean, it kind of is robbing you because they're banking off of you because of your professionalism. They're taking um, a cut from your professional license. So. We do want to pay professionals for help where you don't know how to do certain tasks. There are many times where I'm doing the accounting for people because they don't know how to do it and they want that expertise. But beware of companies who will do it for you, but then how you do business is controlled by them. And you're seeing this a lot, I would imagine, with all of the different companies that will um, get you on insurance panels and everything. All of those companies have rules on how you are going to handle your own business. So um, beware of those companies. That's like buying a boss because you're you are subject to their rules. So as a solo practitioner, you became a solo practitioner because you wanted to be in charge. You wanted to make the rules. So don't lose control of how you run your business. Okay. So that's also a tip, but doesn't seem like a budgeting tip, but it's instrumental to how you make money in your business. All right, so budgeting is very, very empowering. Paying your own way is exceptionally empowering. Taking charge of debt by sticking to a plan to pay it down, it's priceless. You can always find a story where others have it easier, but your difficult road builds resilience. So being able to tack, tackle hard money issues, paying down debt, that builds some incredible muscles for your future. And you are in charge of your own business. I just wanted to give you a quote from one of my readings that most recently from James Clear. The, he's, uh, he wrote um, Atomic Habits. Your behaviors are usually a reflection of your identity. I'm just gonna leave that right there. Uh, I rarely pay, play the lottery um, because I have something to prove to myself. So I would much rather earn a um, million dollars, then win the lottery for a million dollars. I'm going to get into much more of that in my next webinar. It's so excited about in December, which is on the psychology of money. So um, uh, it's really empowering to be making, uh, earning your wage instead of where it is in your control, and you can do things to replicate that success. Okay, so now we're going to get into the nerdy part about the budgeting. So stick with me on this because cash flow is very complicated. So there are three main um, uh, financial statements um, that all accountants and all business owners need to know about. So there's a balance sheet that tells you what you own. Um, there's a P&L, which is your profit and loss statement. That's basically your income statement, which is the summary of your of your income and expenses, so your net income over a period of time. And then there's something about um, there's a cash flow statement. Now, cash flow statement is one of the most difficult of the three to to understand, but I'm going to to show you that budgeting is really managing your cash flow. So um, it's heavy emphasis on the flow in cash flow, and I'll show you what I mean. Okay, so my sons are um, hockey players, and there's this concept in hockey uh, about the flow. So the flow is they grow their hair long, and then they go really fast on the ice, and your hair flows. So everybody wants the nice flow. So that's not the kind of flow I'm talking about here. This kind of flow is um, um, cash flow in. So we're so budgeting and having great numbers in your P&L, in your profit and loss, your net income, having great net income is one thing, but having a lot of cash flow coming in is a separate issue. Okay, so there, there is a big difference between profit and loss statement, that's your net income, versus your cash flow. So does it matter if your counseling sessions are 
increasing every year, but your collections on what is owed to you haven't increased. So like Jerry Maguire said, show me the money. So if you're billing a lot more clients, um, does it really matter if you're seeing a huge increase in your billing if you're not collecting on that? So where might some of those problems be? Those problems might be that um, you're behind in your billing with insurance companies. You are being paid um, for your insurance companies, but you've got to do the reconciliations of that. All of those things are holding you back from that cash flow, that money coming in. Okay, I just wanna throw this out there. You know me by now with with um that i am um really a proponent of uh, quickbooks but i just wanted to let you know that um by increasing your budgeting um muscles you um you can do this cash flow which is co pretty complicated but you can do that even within quickbooks so quickbooks has this whole section um there's this cash flow section right here um and and you can become a cash flow pro so they give you helpful videos and they help you to start planning. So it's all done for you. You, you I mean, you're the manager of it, um, but I did want to let you know that even uh, QuickBooks has this ability. You don't have to just do this on Excel. So just want to throw that out there. Okay, so cash flow has to do with how much money is coming in, actual cash, and how much money is going out, all right? So let's just give you an idea of a, of a very basic way of thinking of cash flow is, um, last month you started with $5,000 of cash. So you had a checking account that said you had $5,000 in there. You brought in cash, so people paid you $2,000 that cash came in. So that might mean that you might have billed, um, last month you might have billed, let's just say Cigna, um, for some clients that you take their health insurance. And uh, so let's just say, I, I have no idea what, how long it takes Cigna to pay, but uh, I'm just pulling that as one of the insurance companies. So let's just say they paid you in 30 days. So that money comes in, that's part of this cash flow in. Even though you saw the client last month, that's cash flow coming in. And the cash flow going out is how much you're actually paying in expenses. Now, if you get a bill coming in, that's not a, the part of the cash flow. It's when you're paying it out that the money is actually going out. And then you have your ending cash flow balance, okay? So this is the uh, numbers from year to date uh, uh, for for the year that you're talking about. So um, you start may have started at January 1st with $1,000 over the last 10 months, or sorry, five months, I, I figured five months, and um, you brought in $10,000, the cash flow out is 4,500. And again, because we're start, starting with um, the same uh, end of the month, um, we have the same amount here. So your projected cash flow, you want to make sure that for your cash flow in, you're including what you've previously billed from insurance companies. So if you know that you've got accounts receivable, which is just your insurance companies that need to pay you still from last month, you know what you you're going to expect to get in this month. Let's just say some of your insurance companies pay you in 90 day terms. So you want to go back several months to say, okay, I think I'm going to be paid this month for the those um, those clients from that insurance. So for your cash flow out, you want to include anything that you automatically have taken out of your regular checking account or credit card. You want to do your irregular expenses and you want to estimate how much you normally spend in the different categories. So let's just talk about your personal spending, your personal cash flow. So if you're looking to next month, you want and you've done a budget, you know how much you normally spend each month. But you also want to include in that some bills that may be due um, that next month that are irregular. For example, my um, trash collection bills me every quarter. So my next month, I might get this, this irregular bill, which is the beginning of the quarter, so that I, um, I have to pay that and I know that that's gonna be a cash flow out. Now remember, when you are charging on your credit card, you are charging it this month but you pay the bill next month. So that's cash flow out next month. So your credit card expenses this month will be money out next month. 
All right. So a lot of times people will talk about, let me see how we're doing time-wise, talk about um, aging your money. So what I want to talk to you about a little bit is what aging your money means. This is a very powerful tool. So aging your money just means that you're using previously earned money to pay for future expenses. Okay. Most people, most payments down on debt is for paying for past expenses, right? So we have to pay for the past by paying down debt. When we are aging our money, we are taking what we've earned now and paying farther and farther out by how much we're aging it um, for future expenses. So if, if we age last month's income for next month or two months from now or next year, we're we're getting older and older with our, our money. So the more you pay without using a credit card or financing, the more cash you have next month because you're spending the cash now um, and, and you're not waiting for the future. You have to pay down that credit card, right? So that's more cash out in the future when you're charging for credit cards. Using a credit card is the opposite of delaying gratification. It's adding to your mind clutter today because it's yet one more thing from the past next month that you have to pay. Uh, in the future. So pay for current and future expenses now from older and older funds. We don't want to be slave to our past spending. We want to contribute to our futures. So that's a little bit about aging your money. Okay, I just want to, soon we're going to get to, to your questions, um, but I just wanted to just remind you that your checking account balance is not an indication of how your business is doing. So many people think, hey, I got a lot of money in my checking account. Um, uh, I'm, I'm just fine. I've, I've made a lot of money. There are two things that I want to say about that. If you are seeing a high checking account balance, that means that you're almost giving yourself permission to be spending that money some way. If you see a high checking account balance in your business checking account, you're thinking, oh, I can pay for personal expenses. But what you, what you might not realize is, is that money, uh, much of that money is not your own. Like it, um, that restaurant example that I, that I said, um, their checking account balance was definitely not an indication of how they were doing because a restaurant collects sales tax on the products that they, um, that they sell and so sales tax is just the state telling you okay hold that money for me until i make you pay it at the end of the quarter end of the month um but you're really just a bank you're just holding that money for them so when you see a high checking account balance you've got to remember that that is for sales tax now in our private practices i i think almost i think there might be an exception of one or two states but almost None of the states um, charge sales tax, so we don't have to worry about that issue. However, your checking account balance doesn't, if it's high and you are not saving for taxes, it really doesn't tell you that you're doing really well because on April 15th, if you're not saving that amount of money um, aside, putting that money aside for taxes and retirement, um, that checking account balance that's really high is, is going to dwindle very quickly. Okay, so this is, again, this is kind of my mantra from my other other presentations, but I just want to go over kind of the status quo of what, like the bare minimum of what we want to do. So I really want you to have peace of mind. Um, so put aside 40% for taxes every month. Figure out what your net income is and put aside 40%. What does put aside mean? Put aside means have a separate account. Have some kind of savings account that you're taking out of your business checking and, and keeping it for the future. That is saving for the future. That's saving for either your quarterly estimated payment or for April 15th, okay? So aging your money is setting up a good future. One of the best ways to lower anxiety is to support your future, right? Because most anxiety has to do with um, worrying about the future. So paying by credit card personally and professionally does create some mind clutter for your future. Pay now for services you are receiving now. That kind of mindset will, will reap benefits um, huge benefits. So paying your own way in life is the opposite of those who have inherited wealth. You are not slave to the lender. So by you earning your own um, way, you 
um, really being successful in your private practice, you are in control because you know you can replicate that and you don't, um, when we are getting things paid for us by others, we have to release some of that control. Prepaying your future is basically budgeting. You are telling your money how it should be spent. Okay. So I just want to talk a little bit about some personal budgeting. So um, most times when I talk to people about personal budgeting, even if, and especially if, they don't keep track of it by any means, like if they don't keep track of it by any kind of software practice, package like any apps that they have for budgeting or Quicken maybe, or if they do zero in personal um, spending habits, looking at it, they already know where the bleeding is. So I usually ask them, what's the biggest problem with the way you spend money? For the most part, I find that most people, um, food is one of the areas that is really tied to entertainment, is really tied to um, going out and being social. And that's the one that's most in our control, but that's one that's really commonly um, where there's some bleeding problems. So these are some main categories for our personal budgeting. Okay, of course, there, there are more. I, I noticed here there isn't even debt on here. So we, you know, if you have debt, that's one of the things that we want to be uh, budgeting for. So, you know, these are the main categories. Um, but my guess is, is you already know where there's some problems, um, but some of these areas aren't in your control, like paying down debt, you just got to do it, right? But there are other things that we, you really can make some small steps to improvement and see great gains. So if you've listened to any of my talks, you know that I always am saying you want to track everything. So you have to track how much income is coming in and how much you're spending out. So really budgeting is finding percentages of what you're spending on. And this is also attaching to your value. So what is the percentage of your total expenses versus your total income? So let's just say you spent $10,000, but you earned $30,000. So your spending is 30% of your income. So where's that other 67% going? Hopefully the remaining funds are going towards paying down debt, future savings and future spending. Are you saving for those irregular expenses as well, right? So make sure your monthly budget includes those irregular expenses. So what's the percentage for each individual category? So if you know you spent $10,000, um, how much of that was spent in each of the different categories? So if you have, um, I, I don't even have entertainment on here. I just pulled from um, a list of common um, budgeting items. Well, no, I do have it, it's recreation. If your um, entertainment recreation is like a huge, huge percentage of your um, spending, of your budget, um, that tells me that that may be where you value, right? Um, so um, do, does your spending match your values? If you are um, needing to spend your money on paying down debt, it's going to be difficult to be spending on your values. Um, so what categories of your spending are in your more immediate control and influence? I find if um, people don't do anything else than um, checking out where they're spending uh, money on food, um, then you're three steps ahead of the game because um, that is the one that is most in your control. And that's where it can bleed into other areas. So your food spending includes the cash you may be taking out um, from the ATM because usually you're paying for food items when you're taking out the ATM cash unless you spend it in other categories. Um, it includes uh, groceries and includes uh, eating out. It includes um, Grubhub and all you know services that come in it includes meal um, prep uh, meal kits that you have delivered to the house it includes everything so um, you know you really want to that is mostly in your control you really want to see where um, how much you are spending and what percentage that is of your monthly budget how am I doing time wise okay got to um, step it up a little bit all right so um, I really um, love the every dollar app. There are a number of different apps out there for budgeting and controlling your money, but I love the philosophy behind um, every dollar. Every dollar is to put a plan and a purpose to every dollar of your monthly budget. Okay, so every dollar has a purpose. 
All right. Um, so I highly recommend Every Dollar app. It is a free app. It's it's through Dave Ramsey. Um, I'm a Dave Ramsey uh, financial coach, but um, but uh, so I'm a big proponent of Dave Ramsey products, but um, every dollar is free unless you connect it to your bank or credit card, and then they charge you a nominal fee every year or every month um, because the banks charge them. So um, I highly recommend that app. Uh, but there are a number of other ones that are really good. YNAB, You Need a Budget is also a really good one too. Um, so I get a lot of questions about um, taking money out of your um, business. And I just want to go over this again, is, is that make sure it's net of taxes and retirement for owner's draw. So when you are a sole proprietor, this is not true for S-Corps, okay? S-Corps are a whole different baby. But um, payments to yourself as a sole proprietor are considered owner's draws. But you don't want to be drawing from your business without first saving for taxes, okay? Taxes and retirement, but just like in a salary job, you get a, sal a paycheck that is net of many different items. You also want to make sure that your owners draw out of your business account is net of many items, okay? So regular draws have to be net of taxes and you also do want to be retaining some in your business. So you're setting aside 40% for taxes. That doesn't mean that you should automatically take 60% out of your budget, out of your um, account, because um, that's for your personal budget. You want to retain some uh, in your in your business. I recommend between I, I recommend 20%, but between 10 and 20% really depends on the business though and and your personal setup. But um, you do want to um, have retained earnings. That's what it is when you haven't robbed all of your um, earnings um, out of your accounts. You want to have some for those rainy days and for your future business and for budgeting, forecasting. All right, so now we're getting to some of the questions that you had um, had um, given us when you registered. So how do I maximize my income in my private practice? It's a great question. I've broken it down into maximizing income and lowering expenses. So for the income side, um, I want you to really try as hard as you can to not spread yourself too thin with multiple insurance panels and types of services. So, um, you know, you want to make sure um, you're not... Um, the jack of all trades because sometimes that can turn into the master of none. You want to make sure you aren't on all different kinds of insurance panels because all of those take management. Even if you have a biller, it's just spreading your energy out to way too many people. Of course, I'm not even going to talk about um, billing related issues with insurance companies because I, I leave that to the guru, Barbara Griswold. Um, so you want to track where you are earning the most and make and what takes most of your time, because those can be two different things. So if you are spending a ton of time with a different with one insurance company um, or one particular service that you offer, but you aren't getting the benefit, like you aren't getting a lot of clients with that insurance agent. Uh, insurance company, you're just getting maybe one client, but that you have to be on the phone for hours for with them. You want to make sure that where you're earning is matching the time you are spending too. Um, and you want to create blocks of time for different business jobs. I have I've been so blessed to be able to meet with a lot of different um, therapists in their private practice. And I've, I've gotten exposure to all different kinds of businesses and how differently everybody runs them. But what I've been really pleasantly surprised about is some fabulous self-care limits that many therapists have been putting in. For example, they will um, see clients on Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday, and for this number of hours. Um, and so they're really building in um, time to either be creative on offering other sources of income um, for themselves in their private practice, like maybe um, doing some group work or, or some writing or speaking um, on those Tuesdays, Thursdays. They're also leaving time for admin time and billing and, and accounting issues. Um, that's what my hope is that they're using that time for. Um, but they're, they're really building in blocks of time to dedicate to certain focuses, okay? So now on the expenses side, we want to make sure we're tracking our expenses. I can't tell you how many times I talk to to people in, with their own business, and I talk to people's per, people personally about their spending, 
and I'll ask them what does something cost and they have no idea. And that's usually not really a fault of theirs, but it's mostly because it's taken automatically out and they just don't have any idea. So I want you to be really aware of how much things are costing because I want you to evaluate every month if you're really getting the value for what you're paying. Okay, also know what each department within your business is costing you, especially if you have employees or contractors. You want to make sure that each area of your business is profitable. Now, um, I give the example of Costco with um, their $4.99. They should be saying $5, right? There's, there's an example of where they're trying to manipulate me. But their chickens, their roasted chickens, are always going to only, only cost um, $4.99. They have said this. This is a loss. Um, product for them. They are losing money by offering for $4.99, um, but they are making money in all the other departments because they put their roasted chickens at the back of the store. How many times have you gone just to buy a roasted chicken? No, you're going to see all the other stuff. And so that they are willing to lose money in the chicken department because of how much they make in the other departments. It's it's a loss leader, but it's really a, a gain because it's building up all the other areas of the of the store. But within your private practice, it's very possible that you might have um, contractors, independent contractors with you that um, they're sharing the wealth in the work. You want to make sure you don't have employees, though. Um, I'll get to that in a minute. But you, um, you want to make sure that... Um, you aren't um, making it so attractive for these contractors that you are paying them more than you are um, bringing in, okay? And that can really happen if you're not aware of your expenses. Okay, so I want to just give you really quickly two examples of um, my faulty thinking. So um, a while ago, um, a client had reached out to me for counseling and um, the first question that they asked me was, do you offer discounts for low income uh, clients? And I made a lot of assumptions when I got that um, when I got that question. That was the only question I it was posed to me. It was through an email. And I thought, OK, they're just um, uh, therapists shopping for the lowest. And um, so even though I wanted to serve this client, I wanted to be able to offer them something. Um, I stuck to my guns and I said, I'm so sorry. I um, The only way that I offer um, a lower fee than my regular fee is I do work um, for this online agency only on Wednesdays, only on one day. Um, right now my availability is off because I'm maxed out on those clients, but that's my way of um, of providing lower pay services because that membership is lower than my fee. I get like peanuts, just a little bit more than minimum wage from that service that I provide. But that is my way of offering sliding scale. I said my availability in that service is off, but if you would like, I will um, I will turn on my availability um, to allow you to come in if you would like to work with me that way. And his response back shocked the heck out of me. He said, um, no, no, I really liked um, what you said in, in how you serve and what, what you do. Um, that your model really works for me. I would like to work with you um, and I will pay your full fee. And he is, uh, we're no longer working together because, um, because of success, but um, uh, he was my best, one of my best clients. Now, if I had just stayed with the idea of, oh, I've got to offer him something, I've got to go beyond my boundaries, I did still offer an option of paying less um, that worked for me, but um, I stuck to my boundaries and it ended up being a win-win. Um, well, I hope he thinks it was a win-win. Um, okay, I also got the question, and now this was not a, a, for a counseling client, okay? So I, I totally understand that um, when you are getting a new counseling client, you want to make sure first that it's a good fit and that, yes, it's the standard protocol is to offer a 15-minute free consultation. But I would like you to um, just consider what that offering of a 15-minute free consultation does. The purpose of that is to be able to make sure you're a good fit. So is there a way that you could communicate that without saying, oh, I offer a free 15-minute uh, consultation? Um, I was asked that question 
um, a, a while ago about if do I offer a, a 15 minute free consultation. Again, this was not for a counseling client. This was for something else. And um, my first thought was, oh my gosh, they expect me to offer something, so I better deliver. Now, years ago, I would have met that expectation. I'm like, oh, of course, of course, I'll offer you something for free. But I, I didn't. I said, you're well aware of what I provide. Um, you've gone to my trainings. You know, you know what I will provide. If if you think you might want to work with me, um, I, I, I don't provide that. I, I've already done my due diligence with you to make sure that they what I'm providing is what you need. So I don't. And they're like, okay, yeah, fine. I just kind of had to ask that question. <laughs> um, but I had to manage my sensitivity to meeting others' probable expectations, right? Okay, how much money, a uh, percentage of total earnings should I pay myself monthly? All right, so payments to yourself, Again, S-Corp is totally different because S-Corps, you are paying yourself a salary. So payments to yourself are owner's draw. So you must first set aside in a separate account at least 40% of your income for taxes. Now, I, I know I'm repeating myself with this. I had a slide earlier, but I really want to drive this, this lesson home. And I do get a lot of questions about owner's draw. So if your personal and family budget doesn't depend on your private practice income, um, so if you don't have to um, depend on your personal budget for your private practice, first save 100% net income towards your retirement if you have a plan with a salary deferral. Okay, that was kind of complicated. But what I mean is, like, I have a solo 401k plan. And because I'm over 50, I get to um, um, contribute what's called a salary deferral to my retirement plan. The first $27,000 that I make in my business this year, I get to put into um, my retirement and that goes against my income taxes. Now I still have to pay payroll taxes on the full amount, but let's just say I made a little bit more because it's a weird calculation. So let's just say I made $28,000 in my business. I could put 27,000 of that towards my um, retirement and I would pay 1,000 or zero, depending on the calculation of income taxes for my business. I will pay payroll taxes, and that's only for federal. You still would pay um, your state rate based on twenty-eight thousand. Okay, so leave in your business a cushion for rainy days. After retaining forty percent of your taxes, don't remove sixty percent of the remainder. Work up to having six months of business expenses retained in the business. So work backwards from your personal budget. If you need to have fifteen hundred dollars monthly from your personal budget, you have to have a monthly net income of three thousand dollars. So that assumed that you're putting 40% of that $3,000 aside for taxes and you're retaining 10% of that in your business. So this is like a no surprises act of my own. What I'm hopefully, hopefully instilling are these good habits so that you have that money to pay quarterly and, at the, and April 15th for your taxes so you don't have a surprise. All right, is hiring a bookkeeper necessary? So I have found in meeting with all of my um, therapists um, in their private practice, that it really are kind of two campers is the way I call it. Um, so there's two camps. There are those who really want to be in charge of their own books and those who only want to know the big picture items. So um, for those who just want the big picture and need help with the day-to-day -day bookkeeping, hire someone with experience. You've got your very confidential, personal, also personal, uh, financial information in whenever someone's keeping the books. So you want to make sure that that person is licensed. I personally prefer to have the peace of mind to know that you are with a CPA who does, maybe they have their own side business of, of doing bookkeeping because maybe they're a stay-at-home mom and they want a little side income. Um, the people who are licensed, are um, their license depends on doing things right and so they could lose their license and their main way of living um earning money um so you want to make sure that you've at least got someone who's bonded right um so you and you want to hire someone with experience think about when you're hiring a biller do you go with just a friend who doesn't have any experience no you're probably going to invest in somebody who really has experience working with the different insurance companies right so if you're using quickbooks if you want to use quickbooks hire a quickbooks pro advisor the pro advisors that's 
one of the things that I am. Pro advisors are the people who represent QuickBooks because they are the accountants who are working in QuickBooks every day and can are very, very familiar with the ins and outs. They might not be the best in teaching you, but again, you're hiring them to do the work, okay? So um, have monthly accounting. Make sure you ask questions and stay involved. If you want to do the books yourself, you do need to get the training, okay? So bookkeeping is not intuitive. It is not as easy as, as the impression is out there. Oh, just do bookkeeping. It's Anybody can do bookkeeping. That is so not true. Anybody can do bookkeeping badly. But um, that, that, those are the people that give me books that the balance sheet doesn't even balance. So bookkeeping is not intuitive. You do need to know what you're doing. Is there a gross income range when one should incorporate? Okay, I think what they mean is instead of incorporate, I think what they mean is to become an S-corp. So um, let me just break it down a, um, a little bit. So remember, an LLC, a limited liability company, is a legal designation. That is different from an S-corp. An S-corp is a tax designation where you are, um, it, you have to apply to be an S-corp with the IRS, okay? So um, the reason um, why you should be an LLC is because if you want that um, personal peace of mind that um, your personal assets will not be um, under risk of litigation if your biz if there's a problem with your business. So right now I am I've been telling people all along I, I have my own business. I'm both an accountant and a, a therapist um, and I manage both um, but I have a malpractice insurance Cum laude. I mean, I've got a ton of malpractice insurance because of the different licenses, um, and uh, that I'm comfortable with that. I have never known a therapist to um, lose their home because um, they were um, exceeded their malpractice insurance and they were sued for their home. However, I do draw the line on certain businesses, certain things that are in your business that I really want you to have that LLC. Um, so it also. California, it's really expensive to have an LLC because I have to pay $800 in minimum franchise tax board fees um, every month, every, I'm sorry, every year um, if I'm an LLC. And I've chosen to remain a sole proprietorship, but I think my risk is really low. But your risk is not low if you have employees. All bets are off. You have to have that protection with an LLC. Um, and then you... Um, if you do take on associates, so you provide supervision where associates are getting hours for their license under your license. That is one where I do recommend getting in that LLC because your license has some risk because other people are using that to get their own hours. So those are the two situations that I absolutely recommend becoming an LLC. Now an S Corp is very different and you are going to get a variety of different opinions from accountants on when you should become an S Corp or if you should become an S Corp. So an S Corp means that you are now a shareholder of your own corporation. So you are also a shareholder and as a member of this S Corp, you um, um, get a salary. So you have to start doing payroll. Now, payroll means that you really need to have a, either a payroll service or an accountant CPA helping you with that because that is not an area you want to mess with. Now, um, many people, there are accountants who say, oh, you're forming your own business, become an escort. I highly disagree. I think that there are um, Many situations, if you're earning huge money, that yes, you can save in payroll taxes. But there are so many other things to consider um, uh, on whether or not you should incorporate. But if you are making really good money, I I don't think forty thousand dollars is enough to start thinking S corp. I think like over a hundred thousand dollars. Then then I think it should trigger some thoughts about maybe you could save. Um, uh, some money in payroll taxes. That's the main thing about being an escort. Do you have spreadsheet recommendations for a budget and tracking it? So I don't really because Excel, there are many templates out there that you could use for Excel if, if you don't have an accounting software package, but I just can't emphasize enough that QuickBooks um, or 
Other accounting software packages, I'm sure, have the same thing, where they really do give you all kinds of tools for seeing both the percentage differences and variances um, and the dollar amounts. So the reason that I'm not emphasizing Excel spreadsheets is because with an accounting software package, you get to compare, okay, this is what I earned last September, what did I earn this September, and kind of compare that or, or compare years, compare dollar amounts and variances, it's all done for you. It's very, very easy. What are some sneaky items that bite at tax time? So if you're working in your books monthly, there are no sneaky items at tax time. So if I've done my job correctly when working with you, you do not have any surprises. How much should I reserve for taxes out of each payment? And is it okay to file at the end of the year or quarterly? So you wanna make sure you are paying yourself a net amount. Retain some earnings in your business, don't drain it all, and taxes are on a pay-as-you-go system. So in, in, when you get a salary, you have taxes taken out, so you very likely have to pay estimated quarterly payments instead of at the end of the year because your, your income is probably that you have to pay as you go. And that only way you have to be able to do that if you're not taking a salary is by paying estimated quarterly payments. What do you recommend for budget savings before expanding from solo to group practice? So how much of a cushion should be saved for a group practice? So the best practice is to build a solid private practice first and then to expand. Um, the greatest deficiency about group practices and partnerships that I have seen personally is that people do not get agreements up front. When you are forming a group practice, you want to make sure right then is, is the honeymoon phase where everybody likes each other. But the minute a problem comes up, and a problem will come up in a group practice, um, you want to have those agreements prior in place, okay? Because you don't want to get the attorneys involved when now there is a lot of hurt emotions uh, involved. So have agreements in place for everything. Attorneys are best from the beginning. Um, there are lots of moving parts to a private practice, but basically what I explained to you about um, budgeting within your, your private practice is the same that I would do for a group practice. You just have a lot more moving parts and make sure your net is making money. So make sure that um, you aren't giving away the farm in a group practice so that you, you the group practice is also benefiting. Okay, how much would you recommend to save for paying clinicians for taxes and for rent? So do not take under other clinicians until your private practice is strong. If there's an area where you don't feel competent and you just want to have um, a business where you have other people taking over that um, that type of service because you don't feel competent in, um, in, in you providing it, I don't think that's the best way to start a group practice. Do not take on other clinicians until you have perfected that, um, that model. So the best um, franchises are the ones where the original storefront was uber successful, okay? Really beware of assumptions that make taking on clinicians is having independent contractors. You might have employees and that is not something you wanna mess with. Um, yikes, because that can be a big problem if you thought you were having an independent contractor, but it, you actually had an employee. Um, you don't get to make that determination. The IRS says they have a 20 question validity test on whether or not somebody is a, an independent contractor or employee. And if there's a gray area, they default to that you have an employee because they want you to be paying them a salary where they get paid all throughout the year. Make sure you aren't paying out more than coming in by contractors and a minimum of 40% every month is, is to be set aside for taxes. Rent can be your next highest expense next to taxes, so make sure you are getting the value from renting. How much should I expect to pay a CPA? Will the tax benefits and breaks result in a net gain? So tax preparation really is just a compliance piece. You can easily find very low costs or zero costs to file your tax return, but a CPA will be able to do these things for you. They will give you your estimated tax payments to be made the following year so you don't have underpayment penalties. They will do some tax planning with you, hopefully. Um, they will um, do the payroll for you if you're an S-Corp. Um, you will have peace of mind because you know that somebody else who is an expert in the field is helping you. And that, 
the peace of mind cannot be undervalued. Um, some firms or services also provide accounting packages where they do your books on a monthly basis and included with that um, can be like, I've seen minimums of like $150 a month um, that they will also file your tax return. Now remember, if you're a sole proprietor, your tax return for that it's called a Schedule C because it's part of your, your Form 1040, which is your personal tax return form. Um, so that's an added expense because in addition to filing your personal return, they're also filing that part of your return that's a Schedule C. So that does increase your personal fee. You might think, well, last year I only paid $200 to have a CPA prepare my tax return. Well, now your tax return just got more complicated because it's that Schedule C component. So S-Corps also involve a, a separate tax return, and so that also will increase your fees. Okay, my top three recommendations, three to five recommendations to create a budget. Keep expenses as low as possible. My number two recommendation is to read number one again um, and to make cuts to your expenses. So there are CPAs out there who will recommend, not so much in private practice, but I do see it in, in um, industries where they have... Um, uh, in, in different industries like uh, selling products and stuff, they will convince you that you need to buy stuff um, that you don't need because it will lower your taxes. I highly disagree with that. So build habits of tracking regularly your budget versus actual. That's my step number three. Bill immediately after providing services. So get ahead of problems before they surmount. Do you keep seeing clients even though they keep not paying their, <laughs> their fee? Don't do that. Um, find dysfunctional thoughts in your spending and possible sabotages to your worth. I see effects of trauma and emotional abuse when business owners don't think they should be making a profit in their helping profession. That is my, I might even find that that might, that's my, my number one, because I do find that that is definitely an issue. I'm so excited. Uh, next month is my uh, psychologist, I'm sorry, not next month, it, my Next presentation with Simple Practice in December will be on the psychology of money. We'll talk much more about that. All right. If you would like one-on-one um, -on -one help, that's a way that you can contact me. And um, finally, I just want to put out there that the end of the quarter of a year is a really great time to get a jump start on QuickBooks. So a lot of times people will be, you know, in summer or September and they'll say, okay, I want to do QuickBooks. I'm like, okay, well, does that mean you want to go back to January and we got to input all that data or, um, or can we just start as is now? So I find that November and December are great times, even though it is the holidays, it's a great time to, um, get the system in place for QuickBooks. And so if you would like to talk to me specifically about, um, you know, I've got some ideas on maybe doing like a boot camp or something, but I really want to um, to offer that during November and December um, that we can get a jump start on 2023. All right, Nick, that's it for me. Thank you so much, Edie. That was so great. I'm glad we were able to get through all the questions. Just want to remind everybody that you will be receiving the video and slides from today's webinar and our email going out tomorrow morning. Thank you again, Edie. We're looking forward to seeing you again in December. And thanks for all the hard work that you do each and every day. We'll see you again soon. Thanks a lot, Nick. Bye-bye.